This is a model of the advanced passenger train on show at Malibu. It's been calculated that such trains could be capable of at least 150 miles per hour on existing tracks and might be in service by about 1974. The train, the result of research by BR technicians, is designed to iron the bumps familiar to rail travelers. It's aerodynamically designed and would be made from light alloys and driven by lightweight gas turbines or electric motors. Air conditioning and maximum comfort for passengers, plus an almost silent ride, are other important features of the train. Hello and welcome back to Everard Junction once again. Today we're going to make a fairly substantial alteration to the branch line. I've not been happy with it and uh, I've slowly been formulating ideas in my head over the last few months on how best to improve it. So as you can see it's uh, considerably different to how it was previously so I'll show you what's been going on. About a year ago I produced a video where I finished off the end of the branch line. It went underneath the main lines, it went into a, uh, a storage area that was over here and in this area, this small area in front of us, this uh, I put a board in and I, I chucked a couple of sidings on there and sort of left it at that with the view of developing further ideas and coming back and revisiting. So here we have the branch line and originally what it did was it came around that corner and then it made a somewhat abrupt turn and went underneath the layout just there. It then revealed itself on the other side and moved into a four road uh, storage area where I could keep some of the units that shuttle uh, up and down the branch line. The idea being that a unit could come in here and I could change it for a different one and send a different one out on its way. The idea was sound but the execution wasn't great and I had a lot of uh, things that I wasn't quite happy with. So the purpose of this is to revisit and improve I've basically spent the last year or so uh, messing around with ideas in my head and sort of trying to see what would work best. So the first and most obvious thing that you've already noticed is that the branch line takes a different and slightly longer route now, passing underneath the main portion of the layout much further down than it used to previously. And this solves a number of issues that I had previously. The branch line was too close to the top deck and clearance between the roof of anything that passed under it was very very small. It would have been difficult to produce a decent looking bridge in this area. As a result of that bridge the gradient in this area was somewhat forced and the branch line descended at a steeper rate than I was happy with. Because the branch line took such a quick turn into this original bridge, there wasn't much in the way of a scene that was going to develop here. It all looked a little bit contrived, a little bit forced. The sidings that I had in this area that connected out onto the branch, forming a small yard or perhaps even possibly a small depot, again it felt contrived. It was It's a restricted space, there isn't a lot of room here. It's about four feet by two feet it's not huge so putting a depot in here would British Rail have put a depot in here no absolutely not they would have chosen a far larger more suitable site about two miles down the line I think this will look a lot better with scenery in it rather than track and trains we will we will have some scenery here whether it be an industrial estate or a car dealership or just a road or even just a field and um, basic natural scenes with an embankment sloping up to the the lines up here whatever it might be i think that's going to look a lot more interesting than just cramming track in for the sake of it so as you can see i have relayed the branch line and i have also removed the storage area that was at the end of it We'll come on to that in a second. The branch line itself is now also on a more gentle gradient of about 1 in 50. So in real life that's still quite severe, but certainly in models it's very, very gentle and it looks absolutely fine. And the gentle winding nature that it now has really suits what I was trying to create originally. And I should be able to get some lovely shots uh, from this angle of those two car units trundling down the branch on their way to wherever this track would go if this place was real. This new bridge now has sufficient clearance for the unit to pass underneath with plenty of room and I can actually do justice and make a proper uh, rail over rail bridge. 
So looking forward to working on that. Is in this area, we will move that small board and those four or five sidings to this spot. And that is where I will keep the units that will move up and down the branch line. This in itself creates some nice benefits. The branch is now a bit longer. It's going to take trains longer to disappear and reappear from the scene. It will give the effect they're actually going somewhere and you have to wait for them to return. So that's a, a just, just a little bit of random bonus, I suppose. But the main feature is having a small board here with the sidings on it to store the units. I can now access this much more easily than I could before. And we can take items on and off of the layout. Anything that derails in this area, we can service the points, we can fit motors for the points and all that kind of stuff. It's a much more sensible place to put something like this as opposed to buried under a bit of scenery over there. So I'll get started on putting together the fiddle yard board. Once again, I'll be using the timbers that I've been able to save uh, from taking this area apart. The same applies to the point work and the tracks. We'll reuse all of it where possible. And uh, there's a few other bits to do, such as reinstating this uh, gray board, which was originally my scenic uh, break. That's where the scenic part of the layout finishes. That can go back into position once all of this is completed. And we'll be back where we were but with a much nicer looking branch line that should be a fair bit more usable and realistic looking. Okay, just putting together the uh, basic board. It's nothing fancy, just using the offcuts and spare bits of material that are left over from taking down the previous setup. So I've just made some uh, basic outriggers that anchor themselves to the existing uh, cross braces that go underneath the baseboards and it's perfectly strong, nice and steady so we shouldn't have any problems there. At the end of the day, this is just a just a place to store a couple of trains, so we haven't got to go mad with the uh, levels of carpentry. For those of you that have not seen my baseboard video, most of the basic framework of the layout is constructed using this very low-end, cheap plywood. Uh, it's basically shuttering ply. It's nothing fancy. As you can see, it's only four plies thick. Now, it's not necessarily an ideal material, but the important thing is to understand its limitations and use it in the right way. As you can see, with the exception of the track bed itself, all of the timbers used to construct the baseboards are placed on their end using the strength of the sawn edge as our load-bearing surface. And that works very well for a cheap material like this. If I was to take this board and flip it up so it was on the flat laid out like a floorboard, it would certainly warp and have all kinds of bowing issues over time if it wasn't properly supported. By turning it on its side and using the strength of the material across this six inches of depth and the sawn edge as our level, we maintain a nice flat surface that is resistant to warping and basically turning into funny shapes. These baseboards are now more than two years old and you can see the untreated cheap material is still nice and straight and level because we've used the strength of the sawn edge to our advantage. Okay, there we go. I never said I was a carpenter, but uh, that's good enough for me. That'll do the job. I might put a leg in the corner, but at the moment it doesn't need it. I will monitor it over the coming months and if it needs it, I'll pop a small leg for a bit of support in that corner. But for the most part, that's finished. We can put some track on it now. It's all just made out of scrap bits and pieces that I had lying about after dismantling the previous setup. But you can see basically we're just using bits and bobs really, but it'll do the trick. We've got the uh, main supports attached to the uh, cross braces of the existing baseboards. And I've just added a little bit of uh, reinforcement on the sides of those as well. So this is nice and firm. And as I said, I may add a leg to the corner if it needs it, but it'll probably be okay. I shall fish some track out of my spares box and we'll start laying some sidings. All oh, right, as you can see, I've just uh, very crudely just roughed out uh, this hole just here. We'll tidy that up a little bit later. And I've just fished out some track from the original layout. This is all code 100 and I've got a code 75 to 100 translator piece, which is quite a ways away. This is all code 100. Just as we disappear under the main lines, we go into code 75, and in my case, bullhead, and then we're on the scenic part of the layout. So from over there, all the way around here, all code 100 just keeps things nice and simple. It's not scenic, it doesn't matter, so I'm just gonna leave it. 
inside the tunnel I've got a Pico freeway point that then spans into two small radius points which then gives us five sidings. So that's actually one more over the previous setup so what I'll do now is uh, move these and get these straight and in position most of this is very old flexi track there's a bit of random set track in there as well we'll get that all squared up and pinned down and then I'll start uh, checking it making sure everything's okay and, and starting to wire things up I expect a couple of problems because this stuff's quite old Okay, I've managed to find enough suitable pieces of track. I've just completed the track laying. It's just pinned directly to the baseboard. Nice and, nice and simple, don't really have to worry about doing anything fancy. This is just a storage area. So as you can see, I've got some stuff here from Rapid. It is a little bit overkill for what I'm doing. Don't need uh, wire quite such a heavy gauge. So if you've got something smaller, that will work absolutely fine. This is what I have in stock, so I'm just using it up. Okay, that's the dropper wires soldered in. Red for positive, black for negative. Make sure you put them all the same way around on each piece of track to avoid problems. I've done an area of them here and an area at this end. Hopefully my old track uh, will still be all right and the joiners in the middle here where there's a couple of separate pieces will still work. If not, I will just come along and uh, solder the fish plates together if I do any uh, if I do have any uh, continuity problems but hopefully that'll be okay. As you can see I've soldered the wires to the side of the track it really doesn't matter because this is just a storage area it is not scenic so it doesn't matter if this was actually on the scenic part of your layout and you were going to do ballasting and trees and bushes and stuff solder it to the bottom of the rail it'll look a lot nicer and that's what I've done on the scenic part of the layout but here it really doesn't matter this is a little bit easier to do. I'm continuing to work on the wiring. It's not particularly easy to film as I have to do most of it on my back, uh, lying down there underneath the baseboard. But you can see we've got the beginnings of a very basic functional control panel and I have driven the first couple of trains into the yard. So what I've done here is I have isolated each siding so I can turn them on and off using these switches. Now you may be wondering, well, why would you want to do that? You have a DCC layout. Good question. Some of the models that I have, you cannot turn off the interior lights, such as the Rapido Trains APTE. So even if I'm not using it, it just sits there with the lights blazing all the time. So now I can turn it off when it's not in use. As most of the units and stuff that's going to be operating out of here all have lighting features, it makes sense to uh, have it isolated. So if I've got another two or three DMUs in the background here, we can make sure that they're turned off and they're not just sitting there, you know, burning out their LEDs, doing nothing. I will be doing something similar to the fiddle yard over the back here, where most of the rolling stock is kept, uh, just to prolong the longevity of, you know, locomotives, electronics, things like that, and to, you know, stop unnecessary use of electric for stuff that's not being used. I haven't got around to it yet. It's a little bit bigger of, of a job, but uh, we'll get it sorted. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll add some LEDs down the side here to just give me a visual indication if I'm stood across the room as to which line is currently active or how many are currently active. And on this side, we'll have the switches for the points. As you've seen, we have a couple of points just in there. They're not the easiest in the world to get to. So I will go through my box of bits and pieces from the old layout and we will motorize those points. And then this will be a nice little self-contained fiddle yard and I can switch the points, isolate various sections and I can see what's going on. 
You could of course take things a lot further and use various off-the-shelf products to make something really quite fancy and professional looking, but for me, on this small yard, I really don't need to bother doing that. I just need a basic level of control and a little bit of a visual indication would be nice as well. I'll also add some LEDs just to show the indication of which way the points have been thrown and that'll be on this side of the panel. Underneath you can see my junction box for the various dropper wires that feed to each uh, individual area where we soldered them earlier and they're just connected to the main layout bus wires uh, which distribute power to this area. As I'm still currently building it and in the testing phase this is a bit of a mess and the wires will be shortened once I'm happy everything is working properly. Okay I fished out the uh, points this is the deck that they sit on. I've cut the holes uh, for the point motors. I just used a pen uh, to mark where the track work was while it was in situ and then took the track off the board, pulled the board out and drilled the, uh, the square holes, or cut the square holes. So now I'm just wiring up some point motors. I managed to find about six or so Pico solenoid point motors in my collection of spares. So uh, that's going to be fine for what I'm doing. This is just a storage yard, so we don't need any realistic servo operation on the points as none of them are on the visual part of the layout. So I've got two here on this freeway point and then on the two small points, obviously we have one each. So basically what we have wired up here is uh, this black wire, as you can see, going across the uh, the bottom side of the solenoid motor that is our common ground for both coils there's a coil at this end and a coil at this end and then you can see we've got a supply for one coil and a supply for the other coil so those two red wires on those two coils run through this maze of wiring obviously it's quite long because i've got to get it over there on the layout uh, here we have the switch so those two wires run into this switch this is a uh, center uh, double throw switch so the central position is sprung it always returns to the central off position you push it up it's one way you push it down it's the other way the supply for that that's the middle wire just there supply goes along goes to capacitor discharge unit you need to use a capacitor discharge unit when using these types of point motors as they require a fair bit of current to get them to throw and the capacitor discharge unit is connected to in this case a 16 volt AC supply on the back of this old controller for demonstration purposes. So in simple terms 16 volts AC to this negative straight to the motor on that black wire on the bottom that's uh, going to both coils positive to the supply on the switch the middle terminal and then the two outer terminals they're your movements, whether it be left or right, and they go to the corresponding coil. So if I take the switch, so there you have it, nice and simple. I will be adding an extra layer of complexity, which is one of these. This is a uh, switch or a polarity switch or a frog switch, or whatever you want to call it. This goes on the bottom of the motor like that and when it goes one way or the other this changes the polarity of the voltage being sent to the frog on the point as I'm using electro frog points. There are lots of diagrams and videos on this subject, there's loads of YouTube videos out there. So there we have it, quite simple, just using odds and ends left over from the original layout. These thin wires here are the supplies to the frogs on the point which need to be controlled using these polarity switches. Alternatively I could buy something called a frog juicer which is probably what I will end up doing eventually but at the moment for the sake of getting this all up and running these will be absolutely fine. So I'll get those all put into place and we'll get this back in position underneath that board. Well they didn't have four switches on this side to control the points and I will eventually rig up LEDs to indicate which way they have been thrown. A couple of hours work and a bit of complexity, however, far easier than trying to reach in there and change the points manually. Okay, so I've placed the track roughly in position and I've wired up everything temporarily. We'll just make sure they all work. Okay, so I've turned it back over and all I'm going to do now is just wire up the track feeds 
and the uh, frogs of the point frog being the diamond shaped uh, bit that's the bit that needs to be supplied with some juice so there's one there's the other this is a freeway point some people get confused with these it's really not very difficult just treat it as two separate points two separate motors two separate frogs follow the instructions that come with it it's a doddle so very simply that's a feed to one of the frogs let's just say we're going on there so that is the output of that switch which is connected to the bottom of that motor those two terminals on the left hand side are positive and negative off of your DCC track feed and depending on which way the point is thrown will dictate whether or not it's positive or negative going through this wire so that the train runs properly you don't get a short circuit when you change the points or when something passes over okay we're almost ready to uh, put this board back into position I've added a pair of droppers just there to get some track power to these uh, this sort of group of points I suppose just a little bit of extra reliability there I've given the point a thorough clean as this is an old unit that was on the scenic part of the old layout so it's it's got plenty of sleeper grime and dirt and stuff all over it but uh, given it a clean and I've done a continuity check between all of the various rails and the rails that they should be drawing power from and everything is all working you can take reliability with one of these a little bit further and you can add some very small uh, bridging wires between the point blades and the uh, regular rails just there and that will give you a little bit more extra reliability if you're concerned about the long term okay starting to get somewhere now i'm going to add a couple of leds just to make this a bit easier to understand we've got uh, the first point second point third fourth and then we can turn on each one of the uh, sidings so quite pleased with that looks a little bit like a bond villain from the 1970s okay slight change of plan so you saw me fit those uh, polarity switches to the bottom of the pico motors well what i've done now is i've connected up a 12 volt one amp power supply to those switches and i'm using those to operate the leds to indicate which way the points are thrown i've just soldered up the LEDs making sure to uh, insulate and heat shrink the uh, positive side and you can see I've added a resistor there as well one killer ohm resistor and a three mil LED but I've used red because I have red in stock uh, they'll go in there and that'll tell me what the points are doing to power the frog I have ordered some frog juices from Gage Master and they hopefully be here in the next few days and we'll try those out and see how they are and that will allow me to do all the necessary electrical stuff for the track and also have the added bonuses of using those Pico switches to do the panel illumination for me as well. Okay, simple, but it works. This will be tidied up. We'll make some uh, much nicer uh, control panel surfaces just uh, purely for experimentation really at this point. But uh, we'll get some uh, mounts for the LEDs so they actually sit properly in the fascia and we'll get something a bit better than just a bit of old plywood. But for the moment, that'll do. Uh, so basically, it's quite simple. You follow the lights to your route. So at the moment, you can see we're headed to the top siding. If we operate that point, we're now headed to that siding. So it's fairly easy to follow. And then we've got the two freeway point controls there. So now we're going straight through into that siding. Now we're going to the bottom one. And if I flip that one, we're now going into that one. So you can see what all the points are doing. So next I'll install some LEDs at the end here just to indicate which track is being powered as currently you have to look at the uh, locomotives themselves. Obviously it's really easy with that one but say for this rail car it's not quite so easy. I've turned it on and it's not obvious. You have to come down and check the marker lights so we'll get some visual indication on there. So I'm just making these now to uh, illuminate some LEDs that will tell me when the various tracks are powered up. This is nothing fancy, it's a bridge rectifier that connects straight to the rails and I've just put a 1k resistor off of the uh, plus 12 volt feed coming out of said bridge rectifier. Two wires go straight to the LED. Nothing fancy, but it'll work for me. Just like the dropper wires, I have 
poked the legs of the bridge rectifiers through some holes in the baseboard and soldered them directly to the rails. I could have intercepted the dropper wires a little bit further along, however doing this just keeps the circuitry nice and out of the way up against the bottom of the baseboard. There you can see them, nicely tucked out of harm's way. First LED installed, now I turn the track on and it tells me that the track is turned on. So now I turn on the track power, the LEDs come on. Okay, everything is pretty much wired up now. I'm just waiting on those uh, frog juices to uh, get the points fully powered. So uh, I won't be able to run too much because it'll just stall going over the points, but I should be able to test things with the APT. Okay, I've just added a little bit of uh, half a millimetre thick card to the outside edge of any of the curves, just to give the branch a little bit of subtle banking for the units as they descend the gradient. It'll just look a little bit more realistic. It's not as pronounced as the banking on the main lines, but it's just an important little detail that should pick up once everything is scenic. I've also connected up the dropper wires to the branch, and I have a pair of droppers sort of every uh, sort of half a meter or so, every sort of two feet. So that should give me some uh, relatively reliable running, fingers crossed, everything should be okay. The one to one rail car should be on its way back from the station. So we'll check out the uh, banking on the curves when it gets here. Okay, it's on its way. So I'm much happier with this now. It all sort of flows better into that scene that I've already done some of the scenery to and then we should be able to get a bit creative here and have a bit of fun with the scenery on this section too. There's much more room as you can see between the roof of the unit and the baseboard and then that should, if everything is working properly, slow down and stop and it'll wait and then it'll go back the other way back to the station and repeat the process. I've only got it set as a uh, short delay at the moment for testing but so far so good. So I'll keep working I need to reinstate the support for this top deck. I had to remove it and uh, I'll fit a slightly smaller, different version that just allows the branch to pass through. That shouldn't be too difficult, should be okay. And I'll also reinstate the uh, bit of bracing properly along the side there. Now we no longer need that bridge. 
So I'm going to continue to work on the area and just tidy up bits and pieces, finish up the last bit of the wiring and bits like that. Hopefully the frog juices will turn up in the next couple of days and I can get uh, these points all uh, properly electrified. At the moment I can only run trains in and out of this centre track as it's all it's all dead on the frogs on the points so uh, once they're in we should be able to get the rest of the uh, fiddle yard up and running and I'll tidy up this uh, tunnel mouth as well. I've installed a little bit of plywood at the end just to uh, prevent any terrible accidents from happening. I've got uh, some lovely uh, self-adhesive sound deadening for cars um, but unfortunately it's at work and I can't get it at the moment but once I'm able to get back to work I will get some of that sound deadening and put it across that piece of ply and that will provide a nice cushion for anything that should uh, try and run off the end of the fiddle yard. So a little bit different but hopefully you enjoyed it all the same. Quite a bit of work, it took me the best part of five days to get this done so I'm going to keep working and uh, see how much more we can get accomplished.